Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and we have yet another solo episode. Uh, I promise this is not going to be a trend. Uh, your favorite ginger, Nick Solheim, will be back soon. He is decamped to North Carolina preparing for his impending nuptials. Um, you can find all of the uh, chronicles of that on his Twitter. Go follow him at Nick S. Solheim. Uh, he's been cooking lots of meals for his uh, uh, in-laws and his parents who are who are back in town from Honduras and uh, having a, a lovely time. We're all going up to the wedding here in a week. So it's an exciting time for us in America moment. We're very excited. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it means that I occasionally have to go solo here. But we have uh, an in- incredible episode for you guys today. We had on Dr. Larry Arn, the president of Hillsdale College, um, who is uh, one of the most impressive human beings in American life, I would say. Um, there, there's there's a lot of criticisms to make of our current elite class in the, in the country and ha- how poorly they compare to uh, leaders at any stage in American life, whether it's the founders, whether it's you know people have led through any century um, or any decade. But Dr. Arn comes pretty close as, as probably generational talent, I know, because everyone tries to get him to come run their organization uh, about once a year. And so, um, but he has stayed at Hillsdale and he's been there for 20 years and he's grown it into something truly great. And we talk about, um, I would say, a little bit more uh, esoteric set of topics than we normally talk about here at American Moment. We talk about uh, education, what it's for. Um, he drops a lot of Greek and Latin translations. Um, he is a I think a romantic in the truest sense of the word. He truly loves what he does. He loves education. He loves this country. Um, uh, but to give his formal bio, I guess, he's the, the 12th president of Hillsdale College, where he's also a professor of politics and history. He still teaches every semester, makes time for it. He received his BA from Arkansas State University and his MA and PhD from the, uh, in government from Claremont Graduate School. Uh, he also studied at Worcester College at Oxford University, where he served as a director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill. If you look behind Dr. Arn during the episode, you'll find that we put up busts of Churchill and Lincoln, as well as his copy of the 1776 Project. Um, he, uh, from 1985 to 2000, he served as the president of the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy, one of our favorite organizations here at American Moment, their current president, as well as basically every single person on their staff, uh, from Ryan Williams on down, our dear friends of ours. We love everything Claremont does. Go check them out. Uh, and in 1996, he was the founding chairman of the California Civil Rights Initiative, which prohibited racial preferences in state hiring, contracting, and admissions. He serves on the board of directors of the Heritage Foundation, the Henry Salvatore Center of Claremont McKenna College, the Philadelphia Society, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and the Claremont Institute. He served on the U.S. Army War College Board of Visitors for two years, where he, stern, he earned uh, the Department of the Army's Outstanding Civilian Service Medal, and in 2015 received the Bradley Prize from the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation. Uh, he's the author of three books, Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, the Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection Between the Declaration and the Constitution and What We Risk by Losing It, and Churchill's Trial, Winston Churchill and the Salvation of Free Government. I think Dr. Arn has the privilege of being our oldest guest, uh, and he has the wisdom uh, to carry with it. Um, He's a delightful man. We're so honored to have been able to host him. Uh, And we'll go now to Dr. Larry Arn. Howdy, Dr. Arn. Thank you for being on the show. Great to be here. Nice to be with you. We always like to get the story of how our guests got to the point where they are today. How, how does one become the, uh, um, you know, the leader of a college as, as incredible as Hillsdale College? Walk us through the, the journey that brought you here. Uh, long, long chain of blind luck. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I grew up in Northeast Arkansas in the mighty metropolis of Pocahontas, and uh, I went to the local college with three of my high school friends. We decided in 10 minutes where to go. And uh, I was forced to take a class in college that I tried to get out of. Uh, I remember all that with great interest because we studied Plato's Republic <laughs> and I uh, was made to do it with a very great man who lives in this town named Jeff Wallen. And he just kicked the daylights out of me. And it's the reason I'm not a lawyer today. <laughs> I went to graduate school instead and I met great teacher and some very great friends of mine and we started the students of professor jaffa we started the claremont institute and uh eventually i was the president of that thing i'm the youngest of them and in graduate school years three or four years is a a lifetime you never actually get over that 
So they're all still my senior. Uh, and But I became the president of it, and I we had some success. And then this college job came open. And a great uh, thing for all of you, uh, your listeners and watchers to know is if you want to be a college president, you can be. There's a thousand jobs a year that come open. And there's nobody good to do them. Uh, and so uh, the last thing I ever wanted to be was a college president. And then this job came open and they were interested in me and I was not interested in them. <laughs> and then uh, you've been a Publius fellow at Claremont, another Publius fellow named Bennett Cooper, a lawyer. Uh, he's in Phoenix. And uh, he said to me, they're interested in you at Hillsdale. And I said, yeah, they are. And he said, read the articles of incorporation in the bylaws. And I said, I'm not going to do that job. <laughs> and he said, humor me. I'm a lawyer. So they called again, and I said, send me those. And uh, to, I, what I thought was I was going to get a bureaucratic document. Instead, what I got was a document written in 1844 by people, some of whom became friends of Abraham Lincoln, had much to do with his cause, helped to shape his cause. Not an exaggeration. And I just saw the magic in that in a heartbeat. And I thought, maybe one could run a college if it has a point to actually make it a real college. And in the way things work, especially in a college, you can't be the point. No one can be. And the president least of all. Because everybody in a college is smart if it's a good college. And... Uh, and colleges are forever rewriting their mission statements. And they don't know enough about the meaning of the word principle to know that they're building a new college when they do that. Uh, and so I knew better than that. and We, we all know better than that. Uh, and so we decided just to focus on that original thing. And that would be the thing one would obey to be a member of Hillsdale College, and the obedience would begin with me. So that's how I got there. And I've been there a long time now, and it's gone pretty well. I think that's an understatement. Now, this was the year 2000 that you started at yeah. Hillsdale College. Um, you know, I, I, I've spoken to, you know, being on a college campus myself not too long ago, talking to predecessors of mine who had led organizations that I was a part of. Um, you know, th there are things that they will say were always bad, even when they were in college, going back to the 90s, and the things that have gotten a lot worse in the state of modern higher education. What was the landscape at the time when you became president of Hillsdale College? Was it as understood as it is now that, that modern American higher education is fundamentally broken? Well, of course, it was all terrible, and now it's all great, and that's, <laughs> and that's because I'm so pretty. Um, no, it was a good college. It was, uh, as these things go, it was well above average. Uh, it, it had its divisions. Uh, it had had a strong president. Uh, he left in a scandal. Uh, of course, we don't know for sure today whether he did it or not. But uh, but he was successful, and he was in many respects at least, and probably in all, a good man. He'd also been uh, unpopular, uh, divisive in some ways. Uh, so you had all that, right? And it it uh, went in some the college looked like a variety of different things, but it looked some somewhat like the conservative movement too, which is it had traditionalists and it had libertarians and it had Christians and they didn't all see eye to eye, and they were contending for mastery, for influence, for prominence, and so that's what a college is these days. Except now, of course, it's woke. And that, that is so strong in many places now that that threatens to build a new form of unity in colleges that is oppressive and destructive of all human thought. So anyway, it was like that, and it was, you know, pretty good. It was, you know, it reached a lot of people, which is very attractive to me. It reached a lot more now. And so, uh, yeah, it was, you know, uh, I remember a number, 25% uh, of our freshman class, the first year I was there, left at the end of the freshman year. And I was astonished to learn that that was actually a pretty good number because wow. the national average today is around 40%. But if 25% are actually leave, 
it means that more than that are thinking about it. And uh, my favorite sport to this day is to eat lunch in the dining hall and torture the students. Because <laughs> I, I tell you, if you want to come visit Hillsdale, Michigan, just find out weeks when I'm in town. They're known months in advance. And you can come with me to the dining hall and we will torture the students together. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the greatest thing on earth. It's yeah. fun. But in the beginning, it was kind of miserable yeah. because there were people at every table that were wish they hadn't come and felt betrayed. And, you know, I would argue with them about the things they didn't like about the college. And I'm an old man, even then. I could win those arguments, but I could watch them in their eyes and see that they were not persuaded. And so I began experimenting. And I had a breakthrough one day. Uh, a young man at dinner table, we have all the seniors over to our house for dinner. My wife is a saint. <laughs> and uh, uh, this young man ticked me off. And I was tired. I was worn out. You know, it's the end of the year. And I barked at him. He said, he, he forgave me for doing things for the donors that the students didn't like. So in other words, he, he didn't understand what he was saying, but he, what he was doing was calling me a mercenary. And, uh, and I said, uh, what are you doing here? I took him on, you know, and he sort of blinked because he was forgiving me. It was a generous act on his part, <laughs> you know. And, yeah. and I, I went after him. I said, uh, uh, I said, why did you even come here? And he said, I love the college. I said, what do you love about it? I said, you want me to implement the social policies of the University of Michigan here. Why didn't you go there? Couldn't get in. Not a good enough long jumper. He was a long jumper. He's a very good long jumper athlete. And, and, and I, he was backing up. And I said, could you read when you came to Hillsdale College? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, did you? And I just noticed I was routing him, and then I, I didn't sleep that night. I thought, I have impeached his choice. So the next morning, we wrote the honor code. And, <laughs> and now to come to Hillsdale College, it's very hard to get into Hillsdale College yeah. now. You have to sign the honor code, and you have to sign on the dotted line. And it's, it's sent to you months in advance. It's in the first communication we have with anybody, student, faculty, staff, friend anybody and that means you know what the college is about and you can't get away from it right i i have a i i give a big lecture to the freshman class it's always fun big old auditorium full of 400 kids and uh they and i threaten the daylights out of them <laughs> actually we laugh a lot but i do threaten them too and i just say when you leave here you're going to sign this document and you've had it for months or you can go home We'll help you find somewhere else to go to college. Never had anybody do that. And that means everyone is a volunteer, which is the correct form of human rule. That's the only thing that really works. And so now at Hillsdale College, we're happy because we chose this crazy thing, and it's our own dang fault. And that's why it works. Obviously, the rest of American higher education has only gotten worse as Hillsdale College has, has improved and improved dramatically and become really a titan today. What is your diagnosis of the pathologies of the rest of American higher education? What is it that they get so wrong at a fundamental level when it comes to what their duty should be to the country uh, and to their students? Well, the answer to that, in my opinion, is everything, <laughs> but it begins with the first thing. Uh, for people to work together. You know, the word college means partnership. I mean, if you want to know what that means, read the Declaration of Independence, the greatest political establishment of a partnership in history. And the basis of the partnership is it has these purposes and we own it. And we agree to serve these purposes. That's how we can work together. Well, if you discard that, first of all, you've taken a despotic step. Because now college is something we're going to do to them. And education does not work that way. Uh, the first line of Aristotle's metaphysics is, human soul stretches itself out to know. 
We love to know. But the energy, the effort in, in knowing is in each one, right? You asked me about my story. The first thing I did when we got in the car was ask you about your story, <laughs> right? And you, it's in you that has got you sitting right here. Some love has drawn you here. And you told me uh, you obviously have really good parents. They wanted you to do something else. But they probably had the grace to know, well, okay, fine, but I'm not the one who actually has to do that. So I tell my kids, I have four kids, and now a grandkid, the most important being on earth. Congratulations. And I said, uh, I always tell them, you have to do something good. Because the only rule that anybody can remember is be good. But how to be good? You know, the good is a definite thing, and you can violate it, and many people do. But how it applies to you and the way the, the way and mode in which you be good, that's up to you. So that's the key, right? You got it. Now, if, if, if you teach that, I happen to teach Aristotle, the greatest writer on that subject in history. Uh, he's writing treatises about the dialogues that Socrates, that, uh, Socrates taught Plato, Aristotle's teacher. And they're just, it's just beautiful to know those things. And, and, uh, and so where do they go wrong? Uh, if you start out by saying, well, they do, they explicitly say this. They say two things that are contradictory at once. They say, you can be anything you want to be. Can you? Can you be an aardvark? Can you know? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, don't rule it out these days. But then the second thing is, there's a way to be, and it's not a rational thing. It's not written in the laws of nature and nature's God. It's the spirit of our age and the things that we've discovered just now. Now, both of those don't invite the student to learn, right? Because what's the most exciting thing to learn? How you should be. Everybody wants to know that. The first line of Aristotle's ethics is every choice and every action and every art, and remember them all, and every inquiry. Those are all the voluntary things human beings do. Aims at some good, and therefore it has been beautifully said that the good is that for which all things aim. If you read that sentence and you don't say, ooh, I got to find out what this thing is, then you're insensate. But if you're not insensate, you go, wow, I got to find out what this thing is. So they've abandoned that now. And it fragments because uh, all of those doctrines they teach today make the individual human will the arbiter. But, of course, that won't work because there are many wells. Which one gets to dominate? And the answer now is really just the dominant one. It's an exercise in power. We think, I mean, Republican and Democrat. Not, not by the way, the last administration is better. I mean, there's, of course, it's very controversial about Donald Trump. But he, in the end, I, I think he, at, at least his education department, Betsy DeVos, they understood that school is not like an engineering project. It's more like nourishing a plant. And it will grow into what it's meant to be. And the growth is in it. It has a soul. And so if we forget that, then this effort to engineer everything into something different is bound to produce nothing but friction. And that's what they have. And they, they, they have no common project except to work upon each other, which is radically not a common project. So that's what's wrong, I think. And it means that uh, in the basic operations, they don't, they don't understand. You know, my favorite way of putting it is everybody needs to be a volunteer. You know, I, I believe if you hire somebody, uh, I've, I've hired many people, uh, I've hired 150 faculty members in 21 years, and I've interviewed three candidates for every one of those positions because I want to know them. And I always want to know one thing. 
and I don't usually ask it in these terms, but it's always easy to find out. What do you love? What is the thing that moves you? What is the thing? You asked me that, right? What is the thing that brought us in this room? We've discovered that it's a similar thing in each of our cases, right? In fact, in the way that it's similar, it's common to every human being. And so you want to find out what, do, you know, if you ask them, what do you want? They'll sometimes say, I want this job. And then say, why? And uh, if they say, because it pays money, they never say that. <laughs> but if they did say that, you'd say, yeah, there's a lot of ways to make money. Why this way? Right? And if you find out that they love the thing that the college does, not the thing I do, I'm one of them, the college does, and, and the part in it that they're applying for, then hire that person and you'll never have to watch them. That posture towards education, one that <laughs> operates off of a term that it, to modern ears can sound silly, but I entirely resonate with it, you know, unadulterated love. That is not the bedrock of the American education <laughs> system right now, to put it lightly. Um, specifically with higher education, though I think this could apply to even, you know, secondary education in some ways. It's it's a credential. It's a check mark that, you know, basically we, we've turned it into a ticket to the middle class in the United States that in order uh, to, to succeed, in order to, to provide for your family, in order to, to have a job that pays enough to, to feed them, you must go to this four-year campus where you will learn not very much at all, um, but you'll walk out with a piece of paper that says you are a citizen in good standing, I guess. Um, baked into that is a uh, is a is a universality i think that the idea that every american needs a four year college education along the lines of you know the way that most people who go to college are, are educated is that part of the problem the idea that that everyone should be learning this way for this long in that setting i mean how how many americans do you think in any given year should be pursuing an education like the one that you guys provide at Hillsdale College? Well, there's no doubt there's too many uh, because of this propaganda, this argument that prevails that you got to go to college. But also, college is extremely heavily subsidized now. Now, it's extremely heavily subsidized at Hillsdale College, too. We spend a fortune on these kids, and they pay a pittance. It's just that they owe us becoming great human beings, and we... And we say, just remember, if you don't do that, I can have you killed. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, but, you know, we're pouring money into it. But just remember the bad thing. And this is a bipartisan thing. We think of it as what we're going to make them into. Uh, Republicans think we're going to make them successful. And successful means uh, getting a job and contributing to the national power. And Democrats, they actually have a different kind of ambition, mostly the left, anyway, not Democrats, the left. Uh, they think we're going to make them proper citizens in the new kind of society we're building, which has a lot to do with their learning to be compliant to the many rules that are coming. Well, both of those are wrongheaded because both of those forget that the movement to know is inside the human soul, and and uh, it it flourishes when it learns the things it needs to know, and it has to learn them. I mean, I, I, I it's been a very great experience for me to be a college professor because I never was regularly before I became a college president, but I teach every term, and I really like it. And uh, what do you learn? You learn about human nature. Because if you just stand there and tell them all the stuff you know, it makes them yawn if you ask them and then disagree with what they say. Now we're all about to start learning. Me too. So that's the thing. And that means it's just radically true. You know, the Latin word for soul is anima, like animal, like animation. It, it, the definition of soul, the, the, uh, Greek word is suke, from which we get psychology. 
the definition of a soul is the unmoved thing that makes a being move within the thing, the source of its motion. And anything that has its motion inside itself has a soul, a bird, even a tree. But we have a rational soul, and that means we have a huge part in deciding how to move. Well, if you recognize that about people, then informing them, helping them learn, inform, right? Give them a form, <laughs> except they have a form, and they have, to, they have to assume that form, and the energy to do it is in them. Well, they, they don't have that right in colleges, and that's an, another reason why we don't know much anymore. We don't know history. We don't know philosophy. We know uh, cheap social media philosophy. Uh, students don't get to sit down with a great book and adore it and, and meditate upon it, right? And they're not even encouraged to do that. Uh, so that's what's wrong. And, and, uh, and see, that's a, uh, you know, it's a profound truth that education is what we say to the future. And so what we do in education is an expression of what we think. And education today is under the domination of one part of the society, the ruling class, you might call it. And that's, you know, that's how they got to be that way. They went into education. They got an education. They took on all the jobs that, that uh, chatter and teach and talk. Well, they run all that now. And they have altered it in ways that I think are disastrous. And the failures are manifest everywhere you look. So that's what's wrong, I think. You mentioned the version that Republicans will, will say about education. They just want you to be successful. I mean, you know, there's been this this meme afoot for 15, 20 years that, you know, oh, you're going to college to study philosophy. That's not that's not a real degree. What what, what job are you going to get with that? That I think that there are errors in the assessment of education on, on both right and left on, on what it should be for. What would you say to people who say that a philosophy degree or a history degree is no different than a gender studies degree? It's not going to get you your job. What's your answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, philosophy, right? That means the love of wisdom. Greek word for wisdom is sophos. Uh, Greek word for love, philos. Philanthropy, you know, that comes from that. Who doesn't want to be wise, right? What was the virtue of King Solomon? Uh, he, he was wise until, by the way, later in his life, he wasn't wise anymore. <laughs> uh, so everybody wants that, right? Whereas not everybody wants to be a plumber, although being a plumber is a fine thing to be. The things that you do for a living, they are instruments the things you know that are the best things to know, they are ends. And and so, and the point is, everybody, I, I don't think everybody should go to college, but I think everybody should get an excellent elementary and secondary education, and everybody can. We have, at the college, we've started now 20 charter schools, a bunch more coming, I think. And after they get about five years old, they just become wonders. They're pretty good right at the start. And that's because there's the adventure of fundamental learning. And everybody, you know, they have their hand up all the time. And they're wiggling with excitement in the classroom because school is fun, right? But it has to possess you by helping you become what you're meant to be. Yeah. Tell me about the... the primary and secondary education aspects of what Hillsdale College is doing, because you guys have started to branch out into it. You now have a, a curriculum that, that you've released as well. Um, what we, we understand what the errors in modern American higher education are. What, what are the, the errors in our primary and secondary education in the 50 states? Well, it's a national goal, last time I looked, to teach every child to read by the end of the third grade. Uh, we've never graduated a kindergartner who couldn't read. Uh, 
<laughs> and, uh, and the reason is they can already read. Uh, we have a new granddaughter in my family, and she's the most important being ever born. Grandpas, it turns out they're they're crazy, <laughs> and, I, and I'm the craziest of them. Well, I'm watching her. She's nine months old, and she's already learning to talk. And you can't really teach her to talk because we, we don't have words in common yet. She's learning to use her voice and her body to make sounds in the way we do. And that's because she knows that we're the same kind of thing already. That means the dawn of reason is in her already. And by age two, she'll be talking. And by age two and two months... She'll know everything in the world. She doesn't even have to leave the house to know the continents and the animals and the oceans and everything, right? So she that's a magic. Every human being does it. Very few who are impaired don't do it, but there's not many. Uh, so reading is just the same thing. It's one step less natural because what little Charlotte does, the squink we call her, is because uh, her mother likes that name. Uh, uh, what she's doing is she's hearing us and watching us, and she's getting immediate instruction back about our reaction to her. When you're reading, you don't have that. Uh, it's not talking to you. So, shut up. So, um, what you do to teach them to read is phonics. They already know the sounds that go with the abstractions that are common nouns, which is a miracle that we can use them. Uh, and so you just teach them to sound out the word. And, you know, ka, uh, you know, I can't do phonics very well. It's too long ago for me. But <laughs> eventually they'll, they'll just learn that the C sounds like this and the followed by the vowel, followed by another kind. Cow. Cow. They know what that is. And and next thing you know, they're reading. It it actually doesn't take more than six months, and uh, in mo you know in most cases, almost all cases, and the ones almost all of the remainder cases, it takes nine months and some more training in phonics. So that that's what's wrong. See, we we don't understand that nature is at work. It is just like raising a plant after you realize the one change, and that is this plant has a will of its own. It is an agent in its own becoming, but its own becoming follows pathways that are of growth and development that are just like the pathways for the plant or the puppy dog. We got a new puppy in our house too. <laughs> so if, if, if you could step back and look at the students, then you could unleash them to do what they want to do, long to do, right? Uh, the greatest teacher in America that I can name off the top of my head is doubtless, you know, I got a lot of really, we, we have a lot of really great teachers at Hillsdale College, but there's this kindergarten teacher that I'm in love with. Uh, she's in Leander, Texas. I've made her into a tourist attraction. <laughs> I talk to her all the time. People go and sit in her class, right? Well, kindergarten, right? Her name is Mrs. Rarden. And uh, so the first time I went in there, I remember, I remember what she, I'll never forget what she was teaching. And if I were five years old, I will also, would also never forget it. So she comes in and she's, uh, stack your blocks. And what that means is you do this. Uh, and that makes you sit up straight. Nice. And then she said, they all do it, right? <laughs> and then she says, uh, today, the second grade, those mighty older, older beings across the hall are coming over for punch and cookies. And so we have to learn a word, you know, and they all go, ah, a <laughs> word, you see? And, and she starts spelling the word. And the word she spelled, C-A-P. And, you know, they're just trembling with excitement. These little wigglers, you know. Yeah. And she's and the word is capacity. We have to learn capacity. And 20 minutes later, 
every one of those kids knows what that is and it ha and has had an adventure you see yeah. and they're they're made for that uh the human soul stretches itself out to know so that's and that's how you do it and doing it i mean uh, i'll give you a counter example so i've seen several times now i've seen a a lesson plan daily what you do on a day under the common core and what's it like first of all it's it's on the front and back of a piece of paper sometimes just the front and there's a paragraph at the beginning and the, the teacher is to read the paragraph right so the teacher is now only somebody who can read Right. Well, second graders can read. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They can, you know, yeah. kindergartners can read. Yeah. So it. Uh, so then, an instruction. You read this paragraph, and then you get them to get out this material, and then you get them to break down. You break them down into groups, and you get them to discuss. And then at the end of the class, and they there's minute, minutes marked. How many minutes? And then you do this next thing, and at the end of the class, they come back and they report on what they've decided. And then there's a paragraph for the teacher to read at the end, right? It's all prescribed. And and what about somebody who knows and loves a beautiful book or a beautiful mathematical operation or a beautiful phenomenon in nature? Uh, you told me before, you love that thing. Right? <laughs> it's a miracle. He's actually levitating that bulb. Yeah. So, uh, so what about the fact that they are naturally attracted to things like that. And what about the teacher, someone, a source of wisdom about that? Yeah. And that's, and, and see, that empowers, that methodology, that empowers somebody far away from the classroom who will never meet the students or their parents and who gets to control all those classrooms by writing that piece of paper. It's despotic, and there's nothing left. You know, my father was a school teacher in Pocahontas, Arkansas. He's the first one in our family to go to college on either side. For some reason, he was determined to do it when he was a little boy. And he 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 found his happiness when he became a school teacher. He never made any money. He was an important man in our town, and because he was a good teacher, and so. That's a dignity, right? And if it's all prescribed by rule from a central place, there's no, no room for any place anybody to live. What are they going to do then if all of this is like this? There's two uh, adjectives people would use to describe the vision of education that uh, Hillsdale represents and, and even the, the charter schools and, and the curriculum that you put out. Uh, one is conservative mm -hmm. and another is Christian um, often they're using those terms pejoratively or in a reductive way to say all this is is a Christian conservative education w what do you make of those adjectives and what do they mean uh, to to Hillsdale's mission or are, are they even accurate uh, one of them is accurate mm -hmm. uh, Hillsdale College has four purposes and they are learning faith freedom and character and those are Specific terms that mean the four fundamentals of, a, of an excellent human life. Now, Christianity is proper because Christianity is the religion that is open to learning. Uh, Jesus is the word. He invites you to hear and think and read, right? So, and, you know, there's lots of things uh, that... Uh, you can only know by faith, but there's a lot of things, including by uh, about God, that you can know by thinking about them. And there are some things that might say that certainly there are many things that contradict the stories of the Bible, and that provides food for thought. Right? We need to understand those stories, like the Genesis account. There's more than one account of creation in, in Genesis. There are two, but uh, one of them seems to be saying that the sky is blue because there's water up there. Well, we appear to know that there's not. So what do you make of that? 
Does that mean there's no God? Does that mean the Bible is a lie? Well, you have to think about that. And, you know, come to find out it doesn't mean either of those two things, in my opinion. That's a, in the academic world, that's a thing explored through discussion and argument and thought. So that's what Christian means. Uh, uh, conservative. That's interesting. I didn't name conservative in one of those four things because conservative is a, is a very interesting term. It's a derivative term. It points to something, right? It, it means an inclination to conserve things, I guess. But which things? Because there's a lot of old things that it'd be better if they'd never happened. You know, murder is an example. Uh, so, uh, also another thing, the sources of the Western tradition, we refer, we refer to it as, it's like studying America. It didn't begin in a tradition. It began in a revolution. First in, first in Jerusalem, this idea of just one God, that was a radical idea. That changed everything. And it was a break from the past, as humans had understood things. Uh, Athens. Socrates is a very radical guy. And just as the Jewish faith first and then the Christian faith were born, on the claim, unprecedented claim, that there's one God, eternal and almighty for every human being. So in Athens, Socrates began to ask the question, what is the good? And not what does Athens say the good is. What is it, simply? What does it mean? He just loved to say, T. Estes, the Greek, what is that thing? <laughs> Let's define it. Let's figure it out, right? And that's... A revolutionary thing, indeed, he was executed by Athens for that. So, uh, conservative. Now, uh, my understanding of, con my, my, my way of being a conservative, I am one, is I think that uh, the good is the first and last question in philosophy. And the answer in classical philosophy and in Christianity is the ultimate good is God, the only perfect being. Now, they mean different things by God, and that's a puzzle. you got to think about that. Um, so, but, but uh, uh, to explore, a, oh, so, a thing for which there's been, a, and see, these are a bunch of qualifiers, right? The things that are worth conserving the most are things that have been claimed on strong arguments. First of all, to know that they've been claimed for a long time, you have to know some history. To know that the arguments are strong, you have to know what makes a strong argument and what these arguments are. But things that have been so claimed for a long time have a special claim to our attention and understanding. And uprooting those things systematically is wiping out the achievements of the past, upon which we depend, by the way. So I'm a conservative in that sense. And uh, the college is conservative in exactly that sense. Uh, but, and, and you have to, so education at Hillsdale starts with the classics. Uh, education in mathematics starts with Euclid. Uh, education in philosophy starts with Plato and Aristotle. Education in, in theology starts with the Jewish Bible, the earliest universal religion, and proceeds through the birth of Christianity and the early church fathers into the medievals and the moderns. And also Islam. We read that. Uh, we are a Christian college. We're not an Islamic college. But Islam, which is 600 years, 650 years younger than Christianity, is an interesting thing. And it's a powerful thing. You should know about it. So, and the, and the thing is, the tradition then is a guide, but the fact that a thing is tradi traditional doesn't supply any final answers, which is the Western tradition to think that. The 
criticisms that come to Hillsdale College are are so often, I think, I mean, it's people who don't really know anything about, about what actually happens at the college. I've had the privilege of knowing a lot of students over the years. Um, you know, people will accuse the institution of, of just, you know, being a sort of right wing front, whatever that means, or, you know, Republican, uh, you know, training ground. I mean, just I've heard all sorts of ridiculous things. But I do think it is interesting that in an era where every major institution in American life has seemed to drift leftward towards wokeness or whatever we want to call it, it appears, uh, at least in the last 20 to 30 years, that, that Hillsdale has become more self-consciously not that. Um, I wouldn't say more conservative based on the definition you just laid out of what that means. Although if, if we're using your definition, it seems like under your leadership there that placing primary the best of what tradition has to offer has, has only grown. Um, how do you see your role and the, the, the role of the leadership at Hillsdale um, in preventing that same institutional drift that has befallen every major corporation, every major college, uh, sectors of government, every institution of important American life? Uh, well, that is my specific job, along with the Board of Trustees. And uh, I, I can only conceive one way, and I think it's the way that human affairs have always worked. Our college was very fortunate. It was founded by a bunch of uh, classically educated, Greek and Latin speaking, patriotic Christian pastors. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Awesome <laughs> adjectives all the way down. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. And, and they understood those things as an integrity, as fitting together. And so they started with a great history. Right away, they were a big force in the Civil War. We were an abolitionist college. Mm -hmm. You know, there, we won four Congressional Medal of Honors in, in the Civil War. We had uh, more young men fight for the Union Army than any non-military college except Yale, which was hotbed of Union abolitionism, but older and larger than we. So pound for pound, we had the most. And then the platform that Abraham uh, Lincoln, which is one of the most beautiful political acts in human history, he was elected on a platform that had discovered the constitutional way to eliminate slavery by forbidding it to spread into the territories. That was thought up on our campus by faculty members who became the governor and lieutenant governor of Michigan during the war, sent the troops from Michigan to fight in the Civil And we had a huge number in the peach orchard on the second day at Gettysburg. And if they hadn't been there, that battle might have gone differently. So... I'm proud of all that, and also it is the being of the college, because think of the word principle. It, it, it means first, but to be first in a series, it has to also mean essential, because the things that come later that fit in the series have the same essence. And so the first thing in the college is the essence of the college. And so, and, and you know, we don't, we don't demand that anybody agree with all of that, even after you're admitted to the college. You just have to agree that the college has a right to pursue its aims. The college has always been a private institution. It's always been a voluntary institution. And so, like, when you come to the college, you subscribe to a bunch of stuff, the honor code, right? But we openly acknowledge you don't really know what all that means yet. You just have to agree that we have the right to set up the college to pursue this. And while you're here, you have to agree to help it, which may include arguing with everything, as long as you don't obstruct. Uh, so that's the way it works. And, and because we start with that beginning thing, and that means, by the way, we're not living our lives in reaction to the latest things. We're living our lives in service to the original thing, which opens up the field for us to talk about and think about all of these latest things, right? Which, in my opinion, are dangerous. But heck, if you read the great books, you will discover that they don't all agree with each other. They invite you into a conversation. If you get into that conversation, you'll be much better equipped to analyze these things that are going on now, which, you know, I'll just criticize them for a minute. I think the woke movement is the destruction of human reason 
which means the destruction of humanity. And I think it will wipe it out. As a first step, it wipes it out in principle. But it will wipe it out eventually in, in fact. So I think that that's an argument. You know, somebody might not agree with that. Okay, what do you think? You know, that's what you do in a college. Mm -hmm. Zooming out to American society more broadly, there there is only one hill still. There's a couple of colleges that I think do many things well as well, but but it's very few. Um, and there are only, it sounds like 20 or so more to come of the charter schools that you guys have created as well. What is a you know, ordinary patriotic citizen to do when there is only one? Um, and how do you and and the team at Hillsdale conceive of of your role in that ecosystem? Is it to be a kind of a refuge and a monastery for true intellectual thought? Uh, or do you have more imperial ambitions? Should should every college after they eventually collapse, uh, you know, come to look at the Hillsdale model? I mean, what is the because this is, I think, goes to a deeper question that I think underlies a lot of internecine conservative debates: is is do we do we exit and rebuild on our own turf, or do we go out into the world uh, and and fight the battles in those institutions right now? How do you resolve that tension? Well, that's a prudential question, right? So, you know, when I'm in my aggressive mode, which. I fear is all too common. <laughs> I will say uh, we're in the world conquest business, and our method, our weapon is teaching. So we want to teach everybody who wants to learn. We always, you know, we, we made a, res a strategic resolution some years ago, just under pressure of demand, that we're going to try to find a way to teach everyone who wants to learn with us. And so we do that, right? We have three million people taking online courses. I've just agreed with the governor of a state to attempt to open 50 charter schools in six years in that state. Wow. And that's hard, right? Because you can't find classically educated teachers in sufficient numbers to staff them. But what we think is true, and we're having some success by approaching it this way, you have to find 50 great headmasters, people who understand what classical education is and have the talent to lead a school and then there's lots of disaffected, excellent teachers in public education who love to teach in a better setting. And what they need to learn from just being a really good teacher to being a classical teacher is not fundamentally different. So maybe it can grow that fast, and we're certainly going to try. And, you know, the month doesn't go by that somebody doesn't offer us a college. And uh, we are going to build some education centers around the country where people, you know, we own, we own one in Summers, Connecticut right now. It has an exact replica of Monticello on it. Wow. And we're going to have seminars there. And we, we have a million people on our mailing list that live within a 90-minute drive of that place. Wow. Probably soon to be one in California, too. We're looking at Tennessee. Uh, so the college is growing, and it will grow as fast as we can help it to grow. And, you know, just remember, uh, we don't raise money, people give it. <laughs> and and, uh, and if, you don't, if you don't forget that, you might be financially successful because the other alternative tempts you away from what you're really supposed to be doing. All you really do if you run a nonprofit is just show people what you're doing and try to make sure it's beautiful because then they'll like it. Uh, yeah, so I, I think the college has been growing very fast, and I think that will continue. And I think there's a service in that because we have built a community of almost, it's about 200 faculty members now, and, you know, 1,700 students at a time. And we've started some graduate schools, and we're going to start some more. But also, remember, it's not our model of the world that we have to do everything others can do and find their own way to do. It's very hard to get into the college business now because it takes a pile of money, and that's partly because the market is grossly distorted by the fact that most of the money comes from the government. So if you don't take that money, which we don't, you get some latitude, but you're competing with that money all the time. 
well, maybe that'll sort itself out, and there are some really rich people. And th they have to understand, though, that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither will a college be. Right? It takes time. People have to learn to work together. They have to get in the habit of learning from each other. They have to practice service to the mission amidst real events. And, that, you know, we find, for example, that uh, it takes five or six years for a charter school to become something approximating excellent. We think they can get pretty good pretty quick, but there's just so much to learn and so many habits and practices to adopt and implement. So this is not going to be turned around tomorrow, but back up a step. Uh, if you want to save the world, it actually is true that the fastest way is teaching. And that's because every time you are successful in learning with someone, you have made not another soldier, you've made another officer. And so that's, you know, I, I think that uh, either there's going to be a terrible, tragic fall in the United States, which is possible. Or, in fact, what's much more likely is they're going to be a wonderful revival of times that, of kind that we've had sometimes in the past. And, you know, the love of learning and the love of perfection, you know, which we cannot be, the love of excellence, those are all things that undergird civilization, and our love for those things are natural. So they're not going to go away. As a final question, what do you think the greatest threat facing the country is right now? Um, I find that I mean, I'm particularly interested in your perspective because in some ways I think uh, Hillsdale being where it is in, in Michigan um, and being in, in the business you are where you get to you get to build a better country piece by piece. Um, you have a slightly different perspective than maybe people who spend all their time in this town in Washington, D.C., or or even your, your former peers at the Claremont Institute, the, the ones that are left in California, they have a, a slightly different, perhaps more apocalyptic perspective of how bad things are. I tend to agree with them. What, 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 what do you make of, of what the greatest threat we face is? Well, it's, uh, you know, there's, in the classic thought, there's four kinds of car causes. And uh, there's material causes, what things are made out of. There's efficient causes, who does what, why. No, there's formal causes, what things look like, what shape they take. Mm -hmm. And there's final causes. And the final cause is the commanding cause. And that's what we love. That's the thing that moves us, right? And there's a fierce competition in America between two alternative final causes. And they're incompatible with each other. We're living in a house divided. And the one that I don't share, I think, is the most powerful and dangerous evil in the world, and actually a kind of sum of evil. And it's attractive in the way that powerful evils always are. It appeals to some good things in us, too, like perfection, like nobody, you know, uh, nobody left behind, you know, uh, so, and, and those are all good things, and those are things that should be pursued. But it's also true that we're not going to perfect this world, but we could make it into something like hell. So that's the most dangerous thing. Are we going to abandon what Lincoln called the ancient faith of the American people? Because if we do, we're going to live in a despotism, and that is the worst possible way to live. Dr. Arndt, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come tape the show with us today. Um, I I feel almost silly asking the question, but but where should people go if they're inspired by, by the things you said today? Obviously, Hillsdale's website. Is there anything else they should keep their eyes out for? <laughs> well, I'm uh, I, I'm uh, trying to convert everybody into a teacher, yeah. right? So I, I tell the graduates of Hillsdale College, you don't just get to be a school teacher. You're going to you do that. That's very honorable. You're going to have to lead, lead a school. Yeah. You've gone to too much trouble coming to this difficult college. So what people should do is they should resolve today. Uh, you can start with an online course. You know, the two 
best ones, in my opinion, and one of them is just a simple partisan point, the Constitution course is the most popular one, and that's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. I think more, more than a million now have, have taken that course. Uh, and then, of course, after that, Aristotle's Ethics, which I happen to teach, <laughs> <laughs> and which is my favorite book. Mm -hmm. But if you start there, you will see a world of learning opening up. And you should pursue that world of learning. And as you learn, you should teach. You should befriend people who are also interested in that and recruit people to be interested in that. You should build a community around that. You know, these 20 charter schools we got now, and I think they're going to be a lot more, those are communities for the parents, too. And the parents learn. See, uh, my daughter ran one of them. Uh, the mother of my grandmother, granddaughter, so she's really great right now. Uh, and she said to me once, well, Dad, you know, I'm a young woman. They treat me sort of like a servant. And, you know, she's in her second week. First time she'd ever run anything in her life. And she's founded a school. And I said, well, that'll stop. And she said, uh, how will it stop? I said, well, they're going to come to an assembly the parents, I think you might have written your doctoral thesis on Aristotle. Am I remembering that right? She said, yeah. And I said, then you're going to tell them what you're going to help their children become. And they're going to sit open-mouthed. <laughs> and she said, how will I get them together? And I said, silly goose, you have their children. Just ask them. <laughs> about, about a month later, she called me up and said, Boy, that works. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the, the future is that, if it's going to be a good future. We are all going to learn and teach and recover the elements of civilization and learn again to live in light of them. Well, uh, if that happens, it will be with Hillsdale's leadership and your leadership. Thank you for everything you do, Dr. Arn, and thank you for being on the show. Honored to be on your show. What an incredible treat to hear from Dr. Arn today. Uh, for this uh, episode of the podcast, I wanted to recommend that you guys actually go uh, listen to something that Dr. Arn mentioned on the show, which is the Constitution 101 lecture series that Hillsdale College has put out. Uh, look, I know a lot of you are young, you're like hard chargers, and you think that most of the institutional conservative movement has failed us, who cares about the Constitution, whatever. I will say, we've put the Constitution 101 lecture series on Am Cannon for a reason. Um, it is a truly enriching experience, and I think you'll learn something new that you otherwise may not have. I'm still finding my way through it, but Jake uh, has, has gone through quite a bit of it, I think, and, and he highly recommends it as well. So please go check that out. Please go check out the rest of what Hillsdale College does. Look, at the end of the day, um, if you're a supporter of the American people, the United States, the American nation, it is important to not just throw away everything that has come before in service of this new revolutionary great society we're going to make. You have to look at what came before. The founders in their generation were young people like many of you um, who created a political document and a civilization that has endured longer than most. Uh, it is somewhat unusual that uh, a civilization is able to endure for more than 250 years. And so uh, looking at the writings of the founders, looking specifically at what infused and, uh, and permeated their theory of governance in the Constitution of the United States is always a worthwhile exercise. Um, I got to do it quite a bit this summer when I was a, a Publius Fellow with the Claremont Institute going through the founders' uh, constitution and, and understanding what they tried to do in creating this political document. Look, I'll put cards on the table here. Um, I will always have uh, a reflexive and pre-rational streak of pro-Americanism in me um, because I'm a naturalized citizen. Like, frankly, if I want to live in a you know perfect monarchy or whatever, I should leave. Uh, I don't intend on doing so, and I don't intend on turning my back on the Constitution or the Declaration. So highly recommend you guys go check out the Constitution 101 series. 
if you have kids, consider sending them to Hillsdale College. Uh, and I would also uh, heavily encourage you guys to go to AmericanMoment.org, where you can find this piece and many others. Uh, go find out the rest of what we have going. We have uh, big events coming up in Washington. I uh, highly uh, recommend that you guys come and join us for those. Uh, and you can just sign up to be on our mailing list and keep abreast of, of everything we have going. Uh, thank you so much for being listeners of this podcast. I can't believe we're still in the 30s uh, on episodes. It feels like we just started doing this a couple of days ago, but you guys have been dedicated listeners. Please rate the podcast five stars if you include a question in your uh in your review we'll be sure to answer it on the show nick will be back soon we'll riff on that for sure um and thank you guys for being listeners of moment of truth and we'll see you next week moment of truth is an american moment studios production filmed at the conservative partnership center our podcast is produced and edited by jake mercier and jared cummings our intro music is a minor struggle by ryan serenich don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.